Coming up in today's newscast, Israel responds to a Hezbollah missile attack in the north. The Prime Minister of Ethiopia arrives for a landmark visit. And the Israeli National Library is already assigning some really cool homework in celebration of the new school year. The school year is beginning with a bang this year, but not in a good way. Just last night, explosions have rocked northern Israel after the Hezbollah terror group in Lebanon fired multiple guided anti-tank missiles at an IDF base along the border. The missiles reportedly struck an Israeli military jeep, leading the IDF to respond with over 100 shells and bombs targeting Hezbollah positions in Lebanon south. Iran has already praised the attacks. אנחנו <אח> 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 <אח>
They are not getting the cooperation that they demand from Hamas uh, and other groups there. Maybe they're trying to put a bit of economic pressure. Uh, it could also be that uh, they want to get more, uh, n more out of Israel as well. Maybe they want mm. Israel to take certain measures in easing the blockade, because obviously that money is an important instrument in keeping the stability in the region. So it could be used to be leveraged either against Hamas or Israel. Uh, Qatar has proven to be very important in basically buying off the quiet for the foreseeable future. So let's talk a little bit about Hamas and their response to this move. Are we going to see any response? Will Egypt respond to this? Is the UN going to get involved? I think that uh, Hamas, for now, will keep the quiet. Uh, there will always be flare-ups here and there. Hamas has actually got a bigger problem with uh, rival groups in Gaza, uh, some that are linked to Iran, like Islamic Jihad, who obviously have been told to step up uh, pressure, step up military uh, moves in order to help Iran leverage what it needs from the United States and other countries because of the sanctions. Uh, I think that Qatar, uh, I think that Hamas will, as long as it's getting basically what it needs from Qatar and others, will still continue to maintain stability. So uh, the question remains if Qatar is going to keep paying, how much it's going to keep paying, and what it wants in return. I'm sure Egypt is trying to facilitate all that too. It, it has a keen interest in having quiet in Gaza. It does not want the violence to flare up. And certainly Israel doesn't want it really to flare up with elections just around the corner. Well, so, so speaking on Egypt, because you mentioned you know, that, they, that they have a, a dog in the race, so to speak, that they have an interest in keeping Gaza calm, uh, you know, what do you think that their reaction specifically will be? Because I know that they've had a lot of trouble keeping Hamas in line. They've had trouble keeping Hamas in line, but in the end, uh, they do come in line. Uh, the question is, how much will Israel take from them? Uh, because every so often, uh, something happens as a mortar shell, a missile, etc. Not always because of Hamas, though Israel expects Hamas to rein in the rest of them. Mm -hmm. I think Egypt's uh, big po uh, power or big uh, efforts right now is to try to get a consensus within the Palestinian community in Gaza. It does not want Islamic Jihad going off on its own and firing a couple of missiles because mm -hmm. Tehran called and said, look, we need a little bit of uh, trouble there because we're trying to deal with the Americans with sanctions. I think that they are pressing Hamas and the other groups for some sort of uh, consensus on stability that's a mutual interest for everybody in Gaza. I think that's where their big role is right now uh, in everything concerning that region. All right. Well, thank you so much for joining us, joining us with your insight. Thank you. Prime Minister Netanyahu is calling on Israelis to boycott Channel 12, Israel's biggest news channel, after his claims that the channel is publishing fake news about his corruption investigations and supporting his political rivals. The Israeli premier is accusing the channel's reporters of publishing false information regarding his investigations. Earlier this week, the Israeli Central Elections Committee rejected a petition from Netanyahu's Likud party, which was attempting to bar Israeli news outlets from publishing transcripts and documents from the corruption investigations against the Israeli leader. Likud is charging that Channel 12's extensive coverage of the criminal cases that Netanyahu is a suspect in is meant to sway the elections. But that's not the only thing that the Netanyahu government is upset about. Channel 12 and its owner Keshet have played a role in producing the HBO series Our Boys, a show that Netanyahu claims is anti-Semitic. The series covers the events leading up to the 2014 Gaza war from the perspective of the investigation into the gruesome murder of Palestinian teen Mohammed Abu Khder. The show has been controversial in Israel for choosing to focus on that death while giving little attention to events that led up to it, like the kidnapping and murder of three Jewish teens in the West Bank. Do you ever wonder why Amir Peretz triumphed in the Labour Party primaries over younger politicians like Stav Shafir and Itzik Shmuli? Well, it turns out that actually Peretz may have Israel's vegan population to thank for this big win. You see, Tel Aviv has the highest number of vegans per capita in the world. In fact, in Israel, 5% of the population is vegan, while well, 13% are vegetarians. And unsurprisingly, many of them are politically conscious and specifically vote for candidates that align with their values. Earlier this summer, a thousand vegans joined the Labour Party and many of them voted for Peretz, a known animal lover. But the truth is that Israel's vegan population spans the political spectrum just like everybody else. And Likud, too, has around 800 vegans among its ranks, while Meretz has around 700. 
Now, many of these politically minded vegans are part of the Influencing From Within campaign, a program that was started by Vegan Friendly, which is an NGO that promotes veganism in Israel. Now, the organization promotes a vegan based diet. They advocate for banning the fur trade and they also advocate for tending to stray dogs, initiatives that most animal lovers can truly get behind. And the campaign hopes that eventually each party will have 2,500 to 3,000 vegans as members. Because according to the campaign activists, animal rights should be placed above politics and everyone, whether they're on the right or left. Uh, they should care about the animal's welfare. Well, as for Parrots, his spokesperson says he's uh, in touch with the NGO on a daily basis and is an avid supporter for animal rights anyways. Vegan-friendly activists say he's putting his money where his mouth is uh, with animal-friendly legislation. And the NGO also cites Meretz's Tamar Zanberg, Blue and White's Miki Chaimovich, and Yisrael Beitenu's Elia Vader as other Knesset members that are cooperating with them as well. So what do they hope to accomplish once a new government is formed? Well, some of the issues they're lobbying for include transferring animal welfare from the agriculture ministry to the environmental industry, labeling meat products as carcinogenic, and subsidizing vegetarian products. It's clearly an issue that is uh, across the aisle. Yeah, huh? it's pretty It's pretty broad spectrum there. I know. We're going to see if I, if I end up becoming a vegan after a piece like that. All right, now turning to some diplomatic news. Ethiopian Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed has just landed in Israel. And the Israeli Prime Minister says that he's taking the opportunity to forge closer ties with the African nation. I think we have tremendous things that we can do separately, but I think that we can do it better together. And in that spirit, I welcome you once again to Jerusalem. Yes. Today there are about 150,000 Israeli citizens of Ethiopian descent, which is perhaps why Netanyahu is calling for Israel and Ethiopia to engage in more security cooperation measures. We also know that the first prerequisite of any government, of any society, is security. We are both being challenged. We're being challenged by radical Islamic terrorists. They not only challenge us, they challenge the world. And we believe that we can offer some experience, some shared uh, experience that we have garnered because of our uh, unfortunate need to defend ourselves. Netanyahu is also speaking of Ethiopia's strategic role in the African continent, hailing Prime Minister Ahmed as one of the most important and influential leaders in Africa. The Ethiopian Prime Minister isn't just here for high-profile diplomatic meetings, though. Prime Minister Ahmed also met with prominent members of the Ethiopian community in Israel, including the mother of Avera Mengistu, the Ethiopian Israeli who is currently believed to be held by Hamas in the Gaza Strip since 2014. Israel's blossoming relations with African nations has only just started to turn around, though. Until the 1960s, many countries distanced themselves from Israel over its conflict with the Arab neighbors. Prime Minister Netanyahu and his predecessors have worked hard to turn this around, though, because African support is not only important in international bodies like the UN, but for security reasons as well. For one, Netanyahu is determined to prevent Iran from developing a foothold in the African side of the Red Sea. And should that happen, Iran could smuggle weapons into Gaza, which would be catastrophic. In other news, 20-year-old Noam Nevis has finally been released from the hospital. The young Israeli woman and her 17-year-old brother were badly injured in an August terror attack when a Palestinian driver rammed his car into the pair. And they were standing at a bus stop outside the Elazal settlement in the West Bank. And since the attack, Noam suffered critical injuries while her brother underwent neurosurgery. Well, unsurprisingly then, Noam's memories from the harrowing incident are hazy. And speaking from Hadassah Ein Kerem Hospital in Jerusalem, Noam told reporters that those first moments post-accident were also like a bad dream. As for the attacker, however, Ala'a Harimi from Bethlehem was immediately shot dead after the attack by an off-duty police officer who witnessed the whole thing from behind. The trend of violence in the West Bank over the past few weeks seems to have risen too. For example, in the very same settlement, yeshiva student Dvir Sorek was stabbed to death. Then 17-year-old Rina Schnerb was murdered when her family set off a bomb planted by a natural spring. And her brother and father were also injured in that attack. Why now, though? Well, experts are asserting that this uptick in violence is mostly due to the deteriorating economy in the Palestinian Authority. But an increase in attacks prior to an election in Israel is also not unusual. For the first time ever, Israel is deporting a Jewish person to an Arab state. Yes, you heard that right. The Israeli government is sending a convicted sex offender back to his home country of Yemen. 
Avraham Salem Al-Haddad came to Israel back in 2007 on a student visa where he studied at a yeshiva in Bnei Brak just outside of Tel Aviv. But that visa expired when he was serving his five and a half year sentence in prison for sexually assaulting a minor in his own family. So once he was released earlier this year, Israel declared him as an illegal alien. And then Israel denied his request to make Aliyah because of his criminal record. So now he has to go and pack his bags. And as for the claim that he needs to reside in Israel to avoid religious persecution back home, well, that was also dismissed. Still, this is new territory for Israel, who doesn't have diplomatic relations with Yemen and has never deported a Jewish person to an Arab country before. So while Israel figures out how to send al-Qaddad back home, for now he's being held at a detention facility. And once back home, al-Qaddad will return to being one of the 50-some Jews that are left living in the Arab state, leaving his wife and six-year-old daughter behind. Moving on, the future is here, Natasha. I know that you're really excited about this. Next I actually story. really am. Obviously, I am because a grandmother has become the first person in the United Kingdom to get a microcomputer implanted in her heart. Yes, and that little computer might be small, but it's estimated to save the UK's National Health Service just about 75 million euros a year. And best of all, it's developed by an Israeli firm. Clearly. The revolutionary <laughs> miniature wireless and battery-free microcomputer called the VLAP has been successfully implanted in Margaret McDermott's heart, a 75-year-old grandmother from Birmingham, England. Around a million people in the UK suffer heart failure, which is basically when the heart becomes too weak to pump blood around the body properly. In fact, it's the leading cause of hospital admissions for people over 65 years old. Now, McDermott is one of those people, and the wireless computer that has been implanted in her heart beams data back to medics, so that they can monitor how her heart is doing. So here's how it works. First, in a short one-hour procedure, the device is attached to the heart's left atrium. The pressure in the left atrium provides the earliest and most accurate real-time indication of heart stress. Then for just five minutes a day, the patient wears a receiver belt that records the VLAP readings in a cloud, making the data immediately available to medical professionals. And finally, the data is interpreted by cardiologists who adjust the treatment as necessary. Now, the first successful VLAP transplant produced by the Israeli company Victorious Medical Tech was conducted in Germany in January of 2019. But beyond the incredible health revolution that the device offers, there are also long-term financial benefits that are gained from avoiding complications and hospital visits, of course. In fact, according to the UK Sun newspaper, if the VLAP were rolled out across the whole NHS, the UK could save up to an estimated £75 million pounds per year. But that will have to wait. According to reports, McDermott is one of the 30 total patients who will participate in the initial clinical trial for the device across the UK, Germany, Italy, and Israel. It's really incredible, Incredible, huh? yeah. All right, now 10 years have passed, and Diane Kruger, one of the lead characters of Quentin Tarantino's sixth film, Inglorious Bastards, My has favorite. made her return to the big screen. And now she's just revealed some pretty cool secrets about her preparation for the crazy role. I know... You are very excited. I'm very excited. And ILTV's Emmanuel Kudosh is actually here with the update. Hi, guys. Well, as someone that always thought she'd be in the most side, <laughs> low-key, Diane Kruger is the lead character in The Operative. So just a bit of background before I shock you with some of the things that she actually got to do for the movie. It's an adaptation of the novel The English Teacher, which is based on a true story and a real Mossad agent. And this same agent actually led Kruger to embrace one of her most challenging roles yet, an undercover Mossad agent. But real quick, let's take a clip of the trailer. I couldn't sleep that night. I remember thinking I'm all alone. And then I realized I had nothing to hide. There you are. Oh, yeah. I just decided I wasn't going to be afraid. Oh my gosh, that looks intense. And I actually. <laughs> Heard about the book, but I didn't realize that it was connected. Uh, and anyway, going back to what you said earlier, Emmanuel, what is it that Kruger got to do in order to prepare for the film? Like, just meet the agent that the book was about? Well, something like that. When she got the script and started preparing for the movie, she actually got to speak to the real agent that the novel was written about, but she clearly wasn't able to, you know, meet with the agent because she's still hiding. 
I get the feeling that this is not the only interesting part of her preparation. I mean, knowing you, Emmanuel, it was probably much more wild. Yeah, that was actually nothing. During an interview with The Hollywood Reporter, Kruger was talking about how she came to Israel pretty early on before the filming started and how she got to do a lot of Mossad training, which I am extremely jealous mm -hmm. of. But what really shocked me was that the agents actually gave Kruger false identities and told her she had to try to get into the airport on a false passport. Okay, wait, what? <laughs> I know. Because that's definitely a test to her acting ability, but like how? I know. When I read that, I started actually laughing because I figured there's no way that she got through. It's Israel. We have some pretty sure. strict airport security. Yes, it should be. The strictest in the world, in my opinion. But she did say that the Mossad was really just, you know, trying to put her in their shoes right. a bit, mentioning that mm. obviously trying to infiltrate Tel Aviv is not the same as an Israeli Mossad agent going to Tehran, but it was still super intense. Yeah, I mean, acting is no joke. That's mm -hmm. serious preparation. A lot of actors have to do this type of preparation yeah. to, prepare, to prepare for big films like this, Apparently. but Emmanuel, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. All right, Aaron, this one's you. Oh, this is all me. <laughs> now, in Israel, sinkholes are commonly associated with the shrinking of the Dead Sea and shore erosion, mm -hmm. but recently, residents of Bnei Brak, a city in the metropolitan Tel Aviv area, awoke to a similar phenomenon. Guess this is real. A sinkhole opened up on the city's Jabotinsky Street, and police were forced to block two lanes of the major roadway while engineers worked out what to do, causing massive traffic disruption for just over 24 hours. But while the situation is under control now, there are fears that the issue is far from over, as general urban development, in addition to the massive construction in the area, like for the building of the Tel Aviv light rail, is leading to groundwater recession and is undermining the bedrock. That's why earlier in the year, a similar sinkhole appeared in nearby Petah Tikva, and again in the vicinity of the light rail construction, as well as urban sprawl. I mean, just look at that. It's crazy. Sinkholes are actually something that happen when the surface layer of the Earth collapses. It's often caused by the chemical dissolution of carbon at rocks, but it's a real problem here in Israel since uh, Israel's wide coastal plains are composed of sand and clay soil. Exactly. And ironically, the causes of the sinkholes are the very same solutions that Israel has come up with for other problems, like Israel's housing and transportation mm -hmm. crises, among others. So Israel had better come up with a new solution and fast because between the construction of the new high-rise buildings and you know, digging and removal of groundwater for the light rail, Another major collapse is only a matter of time. Yeah, that's kind of scary. You don't have to scare everyone. I can try. Oh. All right, now I love this next story. It's the very first week of school in Israel, as we keep mm -hmm. on saying. And the Israel National Library and Facebook have actually teamed up for a very cool new online project called Back to School. Nittany Manson is, of course, here with the details. Nittany. Hi, guys. Hello. Yeah, so this project is a big undertaking. Using social media, the Israel National Library is hoping, hoping to identify the names of children in an archive of over a thousand photos that were taken over a 50-year period, spanning from the 1950s to the 1990s. All right, well, people from, you know, those years are definitely still around, so using social media, how hard could it be? Yeah, well, they've actually done a project like this in the past. Um, that one was called Naming the Soldiers, where they did pretty much the same thing to try to identify soldiers' mm -hmm. identities. And that one was in honor of Israel's 71st birthday, and it was actually pretty successful. Well, I, I, this is, I mean, this is the coolest thing ever. I love going through my grandmother's so uh, photos and trying to identify all of our family members. So what are the people um, from the National Library looking for exactly? Are they looking for just names or also context, um, you know, as to where the photos are from? Yeah, well, in many, of the, in many cases, they don't really know what the story is behind the photos. So in addition to names, um, they're really looking for, for a good story. Uh, mm -hmm. For example, there was one photo that was labeled Student Strike. Uh, well, someone who's actually there commented on it and said, no, it wasn't a strike, uh, but actually a demonstration for the release of Israelis that were on the TWA Flight 840 that was hijacked in wow. 1969. Wow. wow, so this is a really, really great resource for the library to actually document sure. Israel's history yeah. more correctly. And it must also be fun for people to go online and see themselves in the archive, you know? Absolutely. No, it's kind of, it's kind of like, like a real-life Where's Waldo treasure yeah. hunt sort of thing. <laughs> yeah. I, I love, I this love stuff. it, yeah. Yeah, for sure. And, I mean, it's a great help for the library because... I'm sure that questions of who these people are, where they ended up, what are they doing, why are they in these photos, uh, have been plaguing the library staff plaguing, for a while. <laughs> plaguing, that would stress me out. Yeah. Um, and I actually read that Facebook Israel is footing the bill here, right? Yeah, it is. Uh, this collaboration, I think, means a lot for them as well, as, in addition to the library. So where can we see this archive? You know, maybe I know someone who's on there. Maybe you know someone, Erin. <laughs> well, it's available on the National Library of Israel Facebook page. And again, everyone is encouraged to go check it out, try to fill in the gaps. All right, very cool. Nitney, thank you so much. My pleasure.
All right, let's take a look at the weather forecast mm -hmm. now. Tonight should be partly cloudy and warm with a low of 76 or 24 degrees Celsius. And tomorrow you can expect a slight drop in temperatures to a comfortable high of 86 or 30 degrees Celsius. All right, that is it for today's news. Today's exchange rate is 3.53 shekels to the American dollar. For more news from Israel, please make sure to subscribe to ILTV on Facebook and on Instagram. I'm Aaron Porras. And I'm Natasha Kirchuk. Thank you so much for watching.